Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, or early afternoon, late morning, however you want to view it. <laughs> My name is George. Um, I'm on staff with Oxford House here. I got the privilege of working with the northeast part of the country. Um, with some announcements, welcome to the 2022 World Convention. I've been to a lot of these, and, and this, this has been pretty good so far. Um, even me who gets burnt out on these kind of things, I've enjoyed it. Um, it says lanyards and name badges are required to enter all sessions. Silence your cell phones during the breakout sessions or, or we'll take them. Um, no side, they do that in court though, don't they? So I mean, this is very serious in here. Uh, where was it? No side conversations during the panel. Step outside if you need to talk. Uh, Please don't smoke, vape near any entrance, anywhere. Dispose of cigarette butts properly and safely. No littering. Take notes during the session to relay back to your chapter. They probably sent a lot, spent a lot of money to have you come represent them, make them proud. Questions will be at the end. So after each uh, panelist, we'll go to another one. And if you've got any questions, write them down. And we're going to try to save time at the end. This is the working with specialties courts. Um, in 1990, there were only one or two drug courts in the country. Today, there are more than 2,300. The practice and theory of drug courts are simple. It's better to root an alcoholic or drug addict into treatment rather than send them to jail. In jurisdiction after jurisdiction, drug court judges have found that drug court participants tend to do much better if they live in an Oxford house. The NADCP is a is a national nonprofit organization that has promoted, developed, and educated judges around the country on the value of drug court interventions. Not only does such interventions motivate alcoholics and drug addicts to begin and master the recovery process, but it also saves taxpayers the, the cost of incarceration, a repeated, repeated cycling in and out of detoxification and treatment. Paul Malloy, co-founder and CEO of Oxford House Inc., served as served on the board of directors of NADCP during its formation years. Oxford House is a natural partner of drug courts. Many drug court judges have found that their clients do better in an Oxford House than, re than returning to a neighborhood where they are likely to return to old friends and old habits. Panelists are very familiar with the working of drug courts and will offer their observations and experiences with them. They will also discuss how Oxford Houses can best serve drug court clients any expectations of drug courts working with Oxford Houses. Our first panelist, oh, you know what, this is pretty cool. Usually the judges call me up. <laughs> Our first panelist <laughs> is the Honorable Ken M. Soner. He's Oklahoma District Judge, Drug and DUI Diversion Courts. It's pretty simple, forward and back on the bottom right. Right there, all right. Scrolling, how about that? All right, um, well, uh, yeah, uh, my name is Judge Stoner, and uh, it is um, my pleasure to be here. I mean, I, seriously, I've been looking forward to coming for several months, and I got to, I got to come to the Oxford House uh, World Conference last year, it was a blast. Uh, I spoke at some of our regional events, but uh, whenever, it, whenever you present to a group, you know, it's probably best to start with you know, some humor, something kind of funny. And uh, I, got, I got to, I told this joke last year. Well, it's not a joke, it's actually a true story. Uh, but but uh, it's still got a little bit of mileage in it. So I'll share, uh, I was presenting to a group of like state leaders, it's called Leadership Oklahoma, and I was trying to persuade them, hey man, we gotta do something different on this criminal justice side. And I, it was really important to be funny, and so I was talking to my wife, I was like, honey, I've gotta come up with something funny to say. Can you help me? And she said, she said, I, I think you should just skip that. You're not very funny. And I said, well, hang on a second. That's not, that's not true at all. I'm actually, I'm actually funny. People laugh at my jokes all the time. And she said, bless your heart. <laughs> you, know, you know that people laugh because you're the judge, right? And I was like, oh. She said, just, just tell everybody your name is Judge Stoner. You're in charge of drug court. That's plenty funny. That's your joke. So <laughs> there you go. Um, anyway, I am going to talk about working with treatment courts, but first, uh, I just want to maybe get to know you guys a little bit better, let's get to know each other a little better. Um, first of all, do I have any uh, Okies in here? All right, so it's my, my Okie homies right there. All right, 
Nice to get to see you guys. Uh, any, anybody is a drug court participant or gra drug court graduate? All right, very cool, all right, man. Uh, congratulations, and of course, everybody else in here, uh, you're in recovery, so uh, you are my people. You are my people, um, and I tell you, if I have an opportunity to hang out, people would ask me if you'd rather hang out with a bunch of judges and lawyers, or would you rather hang out with people in recovery, I'd actually rather hang out with people in recovery. They're actually far more interesting. Uh, they're kind of more, uh, we'll say, more curious, uh, growth-oriented, open-minded, um, and uh, I mean, they're courageous too. They're, they're, they've got a lot of courage, and I admire them. I really admire people in recovery that have gone through you know, that hell of addiction and, and got to the other side of it. Um, now, w if I do hang out with judges or lawyers, I'm not, they're, they're not really quite as interesting. They're not, they're not, they're not bad people. Uh, they are, they're typically very well-intentioned. Uh, I do get to work with judges and law enforcement. Um, and uh, I know there's some other friction between those groups, you know, people in recovery and law enforcement and judges. And um, whenever I talk to them, I tell them about you, and I tell them about, man, you know, someone's past does not have to equal their future. People can change, they can be very different, and, and the person you think you saw um, in your courtroom, or if you had to put handcuffs on them, that really isn't the real version of them. That's not, that was like, that was kind of like a, a version of them that was really kind of driven by their disease or disorder, and that's really not who they are, and you have to get to know them a little differently. And so, uh, so I'm talking to you, and I'm going to tell you that most of the people that, that judges and uh, law enforcement, they are well-intentioned. Uh, my friction with them is they tend to be a little rigid in their thinking, sometimes a little closed-minded. Uh, and um, they're just they're, they're kind of those little comfortable bubbles, you know, and they don't always want to change. But um, so anyway, I love working with people in recovery, in, in addiction recovery, and um, a lot of them is, is it's because they have this courage. And I do talk a lot about courage in my treatment court. I do think courage is probably a fundamental, uh, probably the most important virtue. Matter of fact, Maya Angelou, she's our poet, poet laureate, had once said, courage is the most important value, most important virtue, because without that, you can't consistently practice any other virtue. And so you have to have courage to be and stay in recovery because you have to have the courage to sit with discomfort while you're making changes. And half the time your brain is telling you this isn't going to work. Why do I have to be uncomfortable? And you got to have the courage to sit with that and, and go through it because, you know, whenever you're in recovery, you'll, you're, you're, and by, by the way, courage, by the way, some people get confused about it. They think it's uh, being fearless. It is not that. Fearless, it's about having fear or anxiety or uh, discomfort. And in the presence of that, leaning into it rather than running away from it. So courage is sitting, is, is, is being afraid, but acting anyway, is being anxious, but doing the right thing in the face of anxiety. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's a, basically that's where growth happens, right? Growth happens whenever you have the courage to kind of lean into discomfort. Um, so anyway, when we talk about growth, talking about growth, growth is like when I think about what is the, what is the nature of an acorn? The nature of an acorn is to become a mighty oak. But, you know, if an acorn, if I just had it and set it on my desk and I didn't put it in the ground, I didn't water it, if I didn't nurture it, didn't have sunlight, it's not going to turn into that. And so, you know, when we think about recovery and addiction, you think about courage, sometimes it starts small, but you nurture it, you nurture it, and you, like, you kind of water it, and you respect it, and, and the next thing you know, it grows, and it keeps growing, and, and just like that acorn, it will turn into the giant oak. Uh, that courage will be the force that transforms you um, into, into you know, what it is you're meant to be. So um, it does kind of remind me, I would, I would never, ever wish addiction on someone. I mean, it is just, uh, it's, it's a horrible uh, disease. It takes your house, your car, your kids, your family, everything you ever cared about. Sometimes your teeth has gone. Um, and, you know, and your dignity and your respect. And, and um, it is just very complicated to get out of it. Um, I also wouldn't wish gel on anybody, too. I mean, gels, you know, it's, it's a tough, you know, <laughs> bed bugs, horrible food. Uh, it's just horrible. Uh, you know, that, that said, it kind of reminds me 
Um, but here I am saying, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but yet here you are on the other side of that. And I'm saying, man, you're the, you're the people I want to hang out with. And so it reminds me of a Zen story that I want to share with you. Um, imagine like medieval China, there was a little village and in the little village, there was a family and this family had a, a son that had turned 16 years old. And in celebration of the 16 year old's birthday, the father had bought a horse to give to the son. That was going to be his horse. And they put the horse in a pen. Um, and uh, everyone says, oh, this is, this is, this is good. We know he has, a, he has a horse. And um, the monk says, well, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. And then um, the horse broke down the fence and, and got out and, run aw and ran away. And everyone said, oh, no, no, the horse is gone. This is, this is horrible. And the monk says, no, oh, I, don't, I don't know. Well, we'll see. And then horses do what horses do, which they herd up, you know. And so this horse that had gotten away actually had run into to, to a couple other wild horses. And because the fence was broken and that horse knew where the food was, the horse came back and it brought two other wild horses with it to, to feed. And they woke up one day and the horses were back in the pen and they just... They just got the, they closed the gate and they, they now had the one horses turned to three horses. And everybody said, oh, well, this is wonderful. This is fantastic. This is good. And the monk says, I, I, don't, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, and then this young man that says, these two wild horses, they need to be, they need to be broken. And so uh, the young man, 16-year-old, got on the horse and is trying to break the horse. And he fell off and he broke his leg. And he was injured, he couldn't do anything. And everyone says, oh, no, he broke his leg. This is, this is horrible, this is horrible. And the monk, of course, you know, says, well, I don't, I don't know, we'll see. And then a war broke out in the region next to this village. And when the war broke out, uh, they came into the village and every young man of, of fighting age uh, was drafted. And they were drafted. And um, this young man, because he had a broken leg, he, he couldn't fight, and so he wasn't drafted. But all the other young men in that village that went off to fight, they were all killed. And so when you look back at the story, you think, well, wait a minute, is it, you got, you got one horse turned to three, three horses, well, that was good. And then, well, wait a minute, you had a broken leg, which is bad, but I don't know, but it, the broken leg ended up saving your life. And so, you know, what is it? Is it good or bad? Well, I'd never wish addiction on anybody. I wouldn't wish jail or prison on anybody. But, I mean, sometimes it, it saves your life, and, and it is so, such an, a better existence. I've been really interested lately. There's a, a, a woman in recovery has kind of started this, you know, her version of the 12-step whatever. It's called the Luckiest Club. I don't know if you've heard that. But the Luckiest Club, you can go to like luckiestclub.com.org or something. And, um, you know, part of, the, part of her, you know, she, she believes, man, I'm so lucky to get to live in recovery. I didn't know my life could be like this. And it's such a better life than I ever thought possible. And the life that I live is more vibrant and more energetic than a lot of people who are not in recovery. And so in a way, it's a blessing. So anyway, I just want to let you know, I, I respect that you're here. I'm so glad to be here. It, it, really, it really is a, an, an honor for me. Um, so, uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, treatment courts in general. So we, we have a general familiarity with treatment courts. I do work under, I've been, a, by the way, I've been a district judge for five years. I preside over one of the largest treatment courts in the United States, we're in the top 1% in terms of size of our program. Um, and uh, we do follow the guidelines that are set by the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, is what George was talking about, that Oxford is a national partner with NADCP. Um, there's a lot of research that goes into drug courts and how we work with drug courts, and to me, the problem with drug courts, there, there are some good and bad drug courts out there, by the way. Most of them are good. Some of them are not. Um, but if you follow the guidelines that are set up by the National Drug Court Institute, uh, you tend to do very well. Um, there's also versions of drug court that are kind of like problem solving courts. There's, uh, there's a, a, a certain drug court that's really focused on tribal community. It's called Tribal Healing to Wellness Courts. Um, and I also preside over uh, a program called Justice for, so Justice for Vets is the national organization, but uh, we have guidelines that are set up for uh, people, men and women with prior military service to be in a drug court type setting, but we communicate with military type language, military symbols, um, and it's, a, it's just an incredible, incredible model. Um, the uh, treatment courts, if they're done correctly, 
uh, they do work really well. That's probably consistently the programs that get the largest, we'll say, gold stars in our criminal, it's one of the few things in our criminal justice system that gets a, consistently a gold star. Um, and uh, they are just generally, if you just to be familiar with them, they're, um, they are considered to be the highest level of supervision in all the criminal justice system. Um, it's, they're somewhere usually between two years and three year programs, year and a half to three year programs. They are for people that have usually been in the criminal justice multiple times, usually not first offenders, uh, and they have high need. That means they have a moderate to severe substance use disorder or moderate to severe mental health issue. Um, and the team that works in a treatment court, we're really focused on problem solving. So I'm gonna use an analogy here in a minute about addiction and addiction recovery is that it's, it, it, you know, people that aren't familiar with addiction recovery, they're not familiar with addiction. They, they have what I call very reductionist thinking. They think, well, the problem is the drugs. If they just quit using the drugs, they'd be fine. If they just quit, that's the problem. If they just quit, it'd be easy. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm telling you, if they could quit, they would have done it by now. Uh, they, if, if they could just quit, that would be really easy. Um, and it's not just, it's not really about the methamphetamine. It's not about the alcohol. It's part of it, but that's not the whole story. It's more like being stuck in a traffic jam. And it's, it's a lot of things. It's not one thing. And I'm going to show you a slide here in a minute that kind of, Helps, helps illustrate that. But we, the, the team members, the lawyers, the therapists, probation officers, the judge, they all work on problem solving. Like what is the traffic jam this person's stuck in and how do you get the traffic going? Um, and uh, we use encouragement and support to kind of encourage the behavior that we want. And then we use sanctions to correct behavior um, and to help people follow the guidelines of the program. In my program, I am not interested in punishing people. I don't punish people, uh, but you might get a sanction. But the sanction in the program is not designed to punish you. It's try to spark motivation to get you to change to follow the guidelines of the program. <laughs> so if you get a sanction, it's just try to give you some motivation or perhaps some insight so you can think about, man, why do I do what I do? And let's try again. And so anyway, that's a little overview of how treatment courts work. And uh, I'm going to kind of well, if you think about addiction, and this is uh, an illustration that I show uh, when I get to talk to other professionals like judges, and um, is that if you think about addiction and recovery, it is a systems issue, and it is also requires a systems solution. So when you want to get somebody into recovery, you have to start with safe, stable, sober housing. <laughs> You also have to form healthy relationships and positive peer associations. So right there, number one and two, you can see Oxford in that little box, right? You have safe, stable, sober housing, healthy relationships and positive peer associations. These aren't good ideas. These are things you have to do. It's not like, oh, maybe you should try that. You know, you gotta try it, you have to do it. It's law of recovery. Uh, you, know, you have to work on someone's physical health, uh, have access to meaningful work, employment, um, spirituality. We used to say spirituality. Now um, all the big shots got together and the people that kind of talk about recovery, they don't like us using the word spirituality because I'm the government, the judge. And so now we use the word sp citizenship. Um, but uh, citizenship is just like how you're connected. You know, and so I, I, to me, I, I'm happy putting the word spiritual up there because I understand what it means. And, you know, if you're in the recovery community, you know, spirituality is just understanding that mystery of that which is beyond and that which is between. Like, what is this that we have in common with each other? And, there's, and we're all part of something a lot bigger in their, our values. Um, but they call it citizenship now. You got to have sober fun, meaning and purpose, healthy habits, sleep, nutrition, exercise, movement, mood regulation. Um, you know, when you're having a bad day, you know, how do you keep yourself on the rails? Um, community connection. And so that is really kind of a formula for addiction and addiction recovery. And so to illustrate that, uh, just imagine in your community, in our, if you're from Oklahoma, I use, a, I use the I-40. I-40 is the highway that travels all the way across the United States. It goes right through the middle of our community in Oklahoma City. And, it, and it's about a six lane highway both ways. Um, and just imagine being stuck in, in, and just sitting in traffic and you're stuck because nothing's moving. And so this is an illustration. If the person with a substance use disorder is in the far right hand corner and you're looking at the back windows of the cars and he can't move forward, he or she can't move forward because they're stuck in traffic. And so people will say, well, just quit using the substance. Well, the substance is the car that's sitting in front of you. But you know what? That car can't move 
until the car in front of that can move, and that can't move until the car in front of that can move, and then you gotta kinda get way out in front of the traffic jam, and how do you get this traffic jam going? Now, everybody's traffic jam's a little bit different, um, so not everybody, this is a, a great example of everybody's traffic jam, but everybody's in a traffic jam if you're, in a, if you're stuck in addiction. And so you gotta think about all these different components of what makes it work, Pot is a peer association. You gotta get. Uh, you gotta work on your mood regulation, mental health, employment, stabilization, uh, good sleep. You gotta surrender. You have a job. Get your stable housing. If you can get all that moving, then the substance abuse can go out of the way. That's why we spend a lot of time trying to figure out the problem solving, um, and recognize that addiction recovery isn't just. It's not just one thing. It's 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 a little bit of everything, and so. Um, also, <laughs> you guys are probably familiar with this slide. When you're thinking about what success looks like, most people think success looks like this. You kind of, you know, one day you wake up, you get some treatment, you're better, and never ever a problem again. But really, in reality, what success looks like, it's a little bit of a messy business sometimes. Um, and so, you know, often it is a process of, you know, one step forward, uh, two steps forward, one back. And so did you think about, um, if you, and if you expect that, and, and by the way, if you're having a bad day um, and you have a setback, that isn't necessarily when you see the, the setback there, it's not necessarily someone's having a relapse. It might be a relapse. It's usually com the bigger dips would be something bad than compounded by a relapse. But, you know, um, so let's say someone's a year or so in their recovery and I mean, they just lose their job. Or they lose their relationship that they've really, the boyfriend, or the girlfriend, or their husband or wife or something really bad happens and all of a sudden you're thinking, oh my God, I put in all this hard work and I just can't seem to quite make it. And because you fall from one point to another, it feels like it's so huge. But if you just stop and realize, man, hey, my worst day now is better than my best day was just a year ago. <laughs> you know, My worst day now is still better than, than it was then. And you gotta just put this into perspective and understand that no matter if you're in recovery or if you're sober, or if you're in addiction, life is a roller coaster. It just is. It's ups and there's downs. There's ups and there's downs, and, and it's about trying to figure out how to how to how to keep th the big picture in mind that hey, we're going to have ups and downs. So, uh, anyway, uh, by the way, drug courts are very effective at crime reduction. Uh, on average, there's been lots of studies. Um, there, th this is a, an example of what they call a meta study. A meta study is a study of studies. And so each one of those is the study that was done, the number of drug courts that were studied and the amount of crime it was, was reduced. And uh, it varies quite a bit to as far as a 12% reduction uh, in crime on average down to 8%. But so if you'd say the average, the average is about 10%. So if you have a good drug court in your community, uh, it also um, means that you have about a 10% reduction in crime. Uh, every dollar invested in a drug courts gets you about a $4 return. And so it depends on the population you have in there, but I don't know, does anybody in here get a 400% return on their IRA? <laughs> anybody? Okay, great place to invest resources in your community. Um, they do work. Um, I'm here to tell you people can and do change, and it's not just possible. People think, well, it's just well, every once in a while you get one and they change. I'm like, no, it's not just like it's a possibility. It's probable. It's actually predictable. If you get in and work a program of recovery, you guys know this. If you, if, if you have somebody that will actually come in and sincerely work the 12 steps or sincerely follow a path, they do get better. It's not a mystery. Um, and so in our treatment courts, uh, it's not just possible, it's probable and predictable. Nationally, drug courts have about a 60% graduation rate. I'm really happy to inform you that Oklahoma County, the, the community I work with, have, um, yeah. 83% uh, graduation rate. Four to five people that come in, graduate, get their charges dismissed, um, really set on a different path. This is a lot of hard work. The difference between what's nationally and the difference between what we do in Oklahoma County, I'm gonna actually give a lot of credit to Oxford because, <laughs> um, we don't, we don't do this alone. I mean, the, the really having Oxford as a really strong community partner is a big part. I mean, it's why I get to stand up here and say, hey, we're doing really good. If we didn't have Oxford, I don't know where we'd be. I don't think we'd be at 83%. But, um, you know, in our, in our program, it tends to be uh, two kinds of people that end up not graduating. People that run away, they keep running away, not just run away once, but they keep running away over and over again. You got to arrest them and try again. And, uh, or they commit new crimes in the program. You know, they're just a really... They really struggle and they, they just can't do it. Everybody else uh, graduates. So uh, we get good um, 
results are now uh, unfortunately not all, most of your courts so when i'm talking about these are drug courts specialty courts um, not all drug courts are created equal uh, there are bad drug courts out there those are the ones that just are not following the model they call themselves a drug court but they're really not following the model that's put out um, and so I, and th they say they do, by the way. They say they do, but it's not true. Uh, because people say, oh, yeah, we follow evidence-based practices. <laughs> oh, yeah? OK. Well, uh, <laughs> how closely? It's almost like saying, you know, well, we play football. We play football. You said, you know, 10 yards, you get a first down. You got to get seven points when you get in the end zone. Well, six plus the extra points. So it's like, well, yeah, we play football. Well, that means you follow the rules of football, but there is a huge discrepancy in the quality of a football program. Okay, just because just you play football doesn't mean you're any good at it. You know, are you good at working, understanding of what they're trying to teach you and really practice the fundamentals and really work on that? And you can become a great drug court uh, if you really focus on um, not, just, not just following the best practice, but, but a skillful implementation of the best practices. Uh, so the, um, doo -doo -doo. I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit. Uh, we do have, I'm not a big fan of incarceration. <laughs> um, and, and, well, and the reason is in Oklahoma, by the way, we are the incarceration capital of the world. Um, and I'm, I'm being serious. I mean, like we have the highest rates per capita uh, for uh, female incarceration, I think number two overall. We were number one in both men and women. Now we're like number two overall, number one in women, number three in men. Mm -hmm. Uh, to give you some perspective on that, like if you took everybody who's in prison in Oklahoma, everyone, and you let half of everybody go, we would still be ranked ahead of 23 other states. <laughs> so we could let half everybody go, we'd still be a little bit right in the middle, you know, in incarceration rates per capita. So um, it also, in incarceration does not treat or cure mental illness. Um, so generally people don't argue with me whenever I say, well, you know, if you, know, if you have diabetes before you go to prison, you'll have diabetes when you get out. I'm like, well, of course. Well, you know, you know, you know, if you're schizophrenic before you go to prison, you'll be schizophrenic when you get out. You're like, well, of course. Well, get here to tell you, man, if you have an addiction before you go to prison, you're going to have an addiction when you get out. Um, it doesn't, incarceration doesn't treat or cure that. Um, I'm not saying there, it can't be a time to pause and reflect. And there are some people that go to prison, they don't use them, they get out. But I would argue those people probably didn't have to go to prison in the first place. They could have probably got better in a more in a community setting. They could have gotten better in a different environment, and they probably really didn't have an, an actual addiction. So um, one other thing in there I was going to point out just it does tend to to make low risk people worse if we send the wrong people to prison. And, and by the way, there are people that need to go to prison. There's people that are violent, predatory, uh, but that's uh, generally not the majority of people that we're sending. Um, it tends to make low risk people worse. And so if you are kind of, you know, not a particularly uh, what we call highly criminogenic, um, so, you know, it's like, so you and I, we, we don't know each other, right? Okay. But, huh? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, so no, but if, if I were to spend time really getting to know the five people that you hang out with, it would tell me a lot about who you are. I mean, I, I could know who you are by knowing who you hang out with. Well, we got people that just spent three, four years in prison hanging out with people that are more criminogenic, and they come out just a little bit more criminogenic than they went in. It tends to be a graduate school for criminality. You get a little bit more antisocial. So um, not interested. And you got to remember that 93% of people go to prison, come back to live with us. So this could be just as simple as, who do you want as your neighbor? <laughs> do you want somebody who's a little more criminogenic or somebody who's access to treatment and they're stable? Because most 78% 78, 78 of property crimes, substance use, abuse, addiction is a relevant factor to driving it. So anyway, you gotta be careful here. Uh, Oxford, you guys can help. Uh, this guy, Brian Stevenson, if you ever have a chance to meet him, he's an author, a speaker, a lawyer, death penalty author, I mean, death penalty lawyer wrote a book called um, Just Mercy. It ended up being made into a movie. It's really interesting. I got to meet him, and he said, he said, if you want to solve a problem, you got to get close to it. I don't know why that's not working right. They messed up my slide there. He said, if you want to solve a problem, you got to get close to it. And so when you think about, and this is what, with you, um, whenever you think how it is that you can help, how can Oxford help in your community if you want to work more closely with your with your treatment courts and actually be part of the crime reduction, part of people not having to go to prison, people getting healthy, 
uh, you know, investing in healing over punishment, uh, you can do that. Uh, but sometimes it takes you educating your treatment court professionals. It takes you out there maybe advocating for, for what it is that you do. Unfortunately, not everybody understands. They don't. And so um, I, I'd ask you to what do... That's what we're here to talk about is partnering with your lo local treatment course. It is really important to try to find a warm and friendly entry to that. So what I mean by that is like, I don't know, you might not be able to just roll up and say, hey, judge, I'm here. You don't know me, but let me just tell you. I mean, some judges might be very open to that. And some of them are like, dude, who are you? Like, I don't know. But if you can find a, someone who has had maybe a positive experience with the treatment with the Oxford House, like a prison case manager or probation officers or... Um, you know, I, I'd say uh, therapists, my slides here. So um, think about how it is that you can find a warm entry into that treatment course. They get to know you and get to know the work that you're doing um, and partnering, but you know, let your community leaders know, your faith communities, um, you know, what you can do. So, but, the, but pro probably the number one thing that you can do is actually just run a good house is is just let your uh there's a guy named albert schweitzer he was kind of a famous physician went to africa was helped built hospitals down there to to cure people and he he said um i encourage people to live their argument let your life be your argument um and so it means just show up for what you care about and so if you really want to do well man actually just start off with just running a good house just run a good house, run a tight ship, take care of your own ship first. It reminds me of, I read this, uh, a, an autobiography of Steve Martin. Uh, so if you're a younger person, you may not know who that is, but the older timers, they know what I'm talking about. Uh, he wrote a book, the, the title of his book, um, Born Standing Up, but he was, he, his argument is, be so good, they can't ignore you. Be so good they can't ignore you. So if you run a good house, that's probably the first thing you can do is just make sure your house is in order. Be so good they can't ignore you. Um, and so also we, whenever I think about people ask, well, Judge, how, do, how is it that you work with a specialty court? How would you want to do that? And I'm thinking, well, maybe one helpful analogy, one helpful analogy we might be like, uh, think about, um, well, if you were, so for guys in here, it's like if you, if you were, wanting to date a girl, uh, or maybe an old fashioned example, if you want to, we call it courting, you know, it's like, well, how do I, how do I do that? You know, you might introduce yourself and just love at first sight, or it might take a little bit of courting, which is, you know, uh, what can I do? I don't know. Maybe just show up for their graduation, give them some, uh, hundred dollars worth of gift cards that they can give out as incentives, um, kind of get to know them and be around and some of ex exposure to them. And so think about it like strategically, like how would you date someone? How would you court them? Um, and also, which also includes being patient, being patient, understanding that the first time you show up, they don't know you, you don't know them. If you don't have an existing relationship, you kind of have to warm up to each other and you got to have a little bit of a track record. And of course, if you want to date somebody, you also make sure you got to make sure you got yourself in order, right? You got, you're running a tight game. Uh, and, uh, and so just be patient and consistent, patient, and consistent, uh, showing up, um, you know, offering things to, for incentives, uh, showing up at community stuff, finding that warm entry, uh, being like the probation officer, the treatment provider and, and starting a, a relationship. So, um, anyway, laws of standard recovery, whenever, the, the, and, by the way, if, if any of you have a judge in your community that like, I don't know, what's this Oxford thing, and you want to call me or say, hey, you can call Judge Stone in Oklahoma County, um, and I'm glad to share with them the, the, the positive experiences I've had with Oxford Houses um, and how I, I believe that this is, again, not just a good idea. You have to have safe, stable, sober housing uh, to, to be in um, we say it was a law of recovery. I mean, this is not just a good idea. Um, you, uh, you know, when you think about recovery, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you know, you're the only one that can do it, but you do not have to do it alone. Uh, matter of fact, when you realize that you've got to do your part, but you can't do it by yourself, um, we call in our drug court, we say recovery is a team sport. You know, it really takes people pulling together to be able to do it. Uh, your tribe is your vibe. That was actually one of my, one of my drug court graduates who's at Oxford House, and he was talking about, man, it really... Um, having my tribe was a big part of, of my uh, recovery, of course. Support and encouragement, accountability. Um, of course, housing is 
critical because you just cannot maintain close relationships. Well, your recovery with people that are still in addiction, that's a law. It's a law. <laughs> if you break the law, I mean, if you say, oh, that's not going to work, and you might do it once or twice, and it's like, see, I can. Like, well, no, you can't because you just started down the road of it never working again. Um, and you have to learn how to have sober fun. And so when you, whenever I look at these laws of sane recovery, what does that mean? Where does that come from? In Oxford House. You guys are really good at all of these things. So I could not be a bigger advocate for, for the work that you're doing in the community and, 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 the, and the people that are in recovery. So um, anyway, that's my, uh, that's my contribution in my remarks. I hope it's been helpful. If I could ever be a resource for you, uh, that's my email address. Uh, that is my chamber's phone number. You can reach out to me. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Judge. When you were saying something, it reminded me I heard a long time ago that addiction is like that one disease that after treatment you're left in a better condition than if you never had the disease in the beginning because self-awareness is much like drug court. Now they're expunging and things like that. So you could have got a different crime, not been on drug court, not got it expunged where after you complete the program, you're almost left in a better position than you were before you even started it. Um, our next panelist, I love this guy. He's an Oxford House alumni regional manager, Joe Chavez. He, see, he's smart. He moved to where we vacation, so he's from Hawaii. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Joe Chavez. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and I have been sober since oh, shit. Shit. February 28, 1990. Come in here, Joe. You know, I got one of those clickers if you need it. I don't it's know really what I, cool. I don't know what I need. It's really cool, man. Oh, it's got a laser pointer. Uh, all right. All right. <clears throat> Working with specialty courts and. Uh, to tell you about myself, um, I wasn't involved in the um, <clears throat> judicial system. I was very fortunate, but uh, we started in uh, Oxford House in Hawaii in early 90s, and uh, our first drug court started in uh, uh, 1995. And we'd have a we have a strong relationship with the court system, but um, there are. Let me just. Uh, this is. Uh, <clears throat> These courts are drug court, veterans court, family court, and mental health court. So there's some of the courts that we have in Hawaii. And typically, they are um, located in the uh, area, like a downtown. It's separate from the courthouse. But um, most, uh, most states and counties, you can most counties, you can go to and find uh, the courthouse and find out if you have a specialty court in your area. Um, Oxford House, uh, or excuse me, Drug Court in Hawaii operates out of the central downtown court. And as of December 31st, 2021, I believe, there are, oh no, this, I've got some updated information. This was, <laughs> as of December 31st, 2021, there were over 4,037 specialty courts across the United States. The most common is Drug Court. It is the most popular, and, uh, but all of the specialty courts, uh, they uh, use uh, common problem-solving courts <clears throat> uh, to, um, to address you know, what they're trying to eliminate is recidivism. I think I said that correct. And, uh, and you know, try to uh, arrest or stop the you know, repeat offender. And uh, we've had some much success in Hawaii with uh, drug court. And I think as far as Oxford House, um, oh, excuse me one second. I, my laptop didn't survive the trip, and so I have two different versions of uh, this presentation. Hang on. Okay. Because what I wanted to say at this one is new court members and drug court. Because... Um, what, I try, what we try to do is, uh, like Your Honor is uh, very correct in saying, some judges will say, hey, 
what are you doing back here in, in this area of the courthouse? Who let you in here? And other ones will like, hey, you know, it's nice seeing you. But I prefer that our best, uh, the, the best examples are the successful people in our Oxford houses. So I always try to get those folks to, uh, you know, pull together and, and somehow if we could get a uh, presentation together for the members of drug court. I'm like, I'm hoping that the staff there and, you know, the, the judge will uh, be impressed with them, but I'm more concerned, I'm more hopeful that the members of drug court will see the individuals, their peers in Oxford House and be so inclined to move in. Uh, <clears throat> but I think it's important to remember from the House standpoint that every member that applies, whether drug court or not, um, they come in through the doors with flaws. And you know, drug court clients are no exception. So I think that <clears throat> most of them, like many of us, you know, had a lifetime of negative reinforcement. And I think you know, I, this is so critical. Like when you're in Oxford House, this is your home. This is our home. So I try to prevent our folks from thinking, you know, I, I equate it to this. When you're out in the world in a busy day, you're working, going to school, treatment programs, what have you, <clears throat> the last thing you want to do is come back to your house and jump through a bunch of hoops like it's a circus. It's like this is your place of solitude, of serenity, <clears throat> and you want to just make sure that you don't get caught up and try to be somebody's, you know, probation officer, you know, parole officer. So our members, <clears throat> will teach the drug court staff a lot about Oxford House. And I, I put this up in no particular order because it's important, it's important for everyone in your house, but it's also important for the new people in drug court. You gotta treat them just like anyone else. Or, excuse me, I said drug court, but I meant any specialty court. You gotta treat them just like everyone, oh, they said it yesterday in the breakout session. <clears throat> everyone has one vote, we're all equal at the table. That is critical. That is so important. Try to, you know, try to treat everyone in the house the same. Don't make special rules for the person coming in with a specialty court. He's got a court officer that will handle that. We enforce the rules at the house. Give Oxford House manual and encourage to read and ask questions. This will benefit him, you, and the house for the course of the stay there, long term. If you can get individuals to understand that um, you know, this is a, a way of life and that there is a way out of this darkness, it starts with that manual. I, I said, treat any, like anyone else in the house. I said that twice. It's important. It is important. You have to, you can't make special rules because Joe came in and he's got a you know, drug court or he's got mental health court. And you, you want to try to de decide, you, no, excuse me, you want to develop a special a professional report with the, the drug court office. Now, to me, that means I'm not calling the judge for any reason. You know, I'm, uh, I want to, actually, I, I work best when I speak one-on-one -on -one with the staff so that we can, you know, coordinate our, uh, our actions. Because what I don't like is when the house when you want to address the concern. And there's like Batman, oh, I was up at 11 o'clock and he didn't show up until 11.04 and I need to call his probation officer. It's like, no, calm down, calm down, you know? And, or it's Santa, well, I wasn't home, but I'm pretty sure he wasn't either, so. And it's like, <laughs> what are you, naughty or nice? Well, we're not crime fighters and we're supposed to be in this together. And so you have to give, I think it's very important when your Honor said, you know, well, we're in this together. We're not, you know, we have to be able to rely on each other. I, I lost track, but I did want to mention, <laughs> I attended the, uh, what is that, uh, National Association of Drug Court Professionals in Anaheim a few years back. Those people can party. They can, <laughs> they can, uh, they can hold their own against a bunch of folks in recovery. I know that. I was there. <laughs> anyway, uh, let them know that, um, we don't want to run to the drug court 
we don't want to run to the court to report on you know, every infraction that occurs at the house from one of their clients. However, if one of their clients is, you know, we're putting them on a behavioral contract and this is like the third one and you know, things are looking dim, you might want to give a call and say, hey, you know, this is what's, what has been happening and this is where it's going to go unless you, some changes are, are modified, are made. But always, in uh, the shining example, our house. You know, you want to you want to attract people to your house, drug court, specialty court, guy off the street, guy in AA. You want to run a good house, have a weekly house meeting, faithfully. Do your individual job assignment as an example, and that does that. And that doesn't just mean do your house chore. It also means do the paperwork fill out the treasury report, the secretary, do it before the meeting so you do it right and you're not rushed and you don't make everybody wait and you're confident in the numbers that you're about to give. And then the individual in the house, you do your assigned chore and then you follow up the numbers to make sure that they are in fact accurate. Take time to listen to the new people. A guy coming out of drug court, coming out of the uh, jail system, prison system, I'm sure he needs somebody that he needs to talk with. And I don't know who it is. It might be you. Use your personal recovery as a shining example of what can be gained by moving into Oxford House. There is no bigger you know, attraction than when I send a team over to a treatment facility and they see these guys that went through that same facility, but here they are you know, 18 months later and they're, they're rocking it. They're, they're making it every day. They're getting up, doing what they have to do, they're sober, and they're actively involved in trying to help other people get sober. That's, that's crucial. I have no questions. <laughs> questions at the end, thank you. I was trying to figure out that Santa thing. Was that like sees you when you're sleeping or something like? <laughs> <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Okay, our next panelist is Ms. Karen McKinnon. She's Oxford House alumnus and Women's Resource Coordinator in North Carolina. Karen came into sobriety on 7-26-1996. How's this getting going? <laughs> uh, she moved into the Brentwood Oxford House on October 11, 1996, became a certified dental assistant in 1999, went back to college in 2011, when hired full-time for Oxford House as a woman's resource coordinator. She's also a national certified peer recovery specialist, support specialist, certified substance abuse counselor, and a notary. Karen is passionate about helping men, about helping women and their children. So please help me welcome Karen. One correction, I used to be passionate about helping men. <laughs> Not anymore. Hey everyone, I'm Karen. I'm a woman in long-term recovery and I'm so blessed that I haven't found a reason to want to use. Sickness, poor health. When I came in Oxford House, I want to give you this story because at first I wondered why am I on specialty courts? When I came in, I was on uh, probation for taking money from my dad's friend's bookstore. He went out of town and had me run the bookstore and we just partied. And that's what I thought she was supposed to do. But obviously my dad thought that I needed a lesson because he told his friend, you need to press charges against my daughter. And he did. And I had never had any type of uh, involvement with uh, the courts or anything. But when I tell you, I was terrified um, because they said, if you don't pay the money that you're owed, if you um, get a, a positive urinalysis, you're going to jail. I mean, they, they really scared me. So um, I had a wonderful uh, PO. Um, God rest his soul, Alan Wolf. I've never forgotten his name because he's the one 
that said, you know, you don't really belong out here. Let's get you some help. And I said, well, nothing has worked. And he says, well, we're going to get you some help. So um, I went to treatment and I came out and I went into a program called Southlight in our area. And they help women with children. They help people in recovery that want recovery. So um, I left the Southlight program after 90 days and I went into an Oxford house. And when I tell you, um, I felt like I was at home uh, because I had a lot of money to pay back to probation. Um, I think I was in jail for that one day and I called my dad, I said, if you don't come get me, I'm gonna burn the house down when I get there. You better come get me out of here. <laughs> and um, yeah, I was a little dramatic back then. But um, so I think when dealing with specialty courts, I, I, I love the analogies everyone used. The analogies is what helped me. Like, I remember I, I'm a, a little geek. I like National Geographic. I love that magazine. Right, so I read about the sequoia trees, um, and I think I shared about this in one of our Oxford House women's meetings in 2015 or 16. Sequoia trees are a, an anomaly, and they are so magnificent to me. That is on my bucket list. Their roots don't grow down, they grow this way. And in growing that way, they connect with one another. That connection that they have makes each other stronger. And in relation to recovery courts, because we call it recovery courts in North Carolina, um, because we want people to recover, but we have to connect with them. I had to connect with the people in recovery court. And when they first asked us to come in, um, I said, well, we did accept people in recovery court. I don't live in a house, so I can't accept or deny. I said, but they leave owing a lot of money. And the reason they did, guys, is because they had to take care of their families. They had to pay restitution. And I mean, it was a lot of pressure. So I said, well, when you guys find some money for us, call me and we'll come down back down here and have a talk. And so a year later, they found some money. And when Kathleen and I got the email, I was like, oh, they didn't say how much the cap was on the money. And it's, it's still going strong. So when people from recovery court come in, um, and I know that they're going to get some money coming because I invoice for them, um, I make a connection with the people who are in the houses. Because if, if we don't connect with them, they think, oh, somebody's paying my rent, and I'm good to go. Well, first, it's EES, and no, you're not good to go, because if you're not paying these other fees that are being incurred and you're not following the basic guidelines that we have set for you for you to have a different life, see, that's what the Sequoias do. They keep each other in line, right? So um, what I believe in all my relationships that I have with community partners is that I have to communicate clearly I have to let them know who we are, and I have to find out who they are. And that's where um, my coworkers come in. We have a, um, a presentation via Zoom. And we ask that the judge be on there as well. So we have judges in our recovery courts that are so, um, I guess I would say accepting and compassionate because just like uh, Judge Stoner here, they don't want them in jail. They want them out being productive, and that's where the Oxford House team comes in. That's where their house comes in. And they don't know I'm calling, checking on them, but I have to call and check on them. I have to talk to their, after the release of information, I have to talk to their, um, their drug court person to make sure, are they doing what they're supposed to do? Are they making it there? What's happening? So now the relationship has gotten so tight between uh, Oxford House, the recovery court team, and that person that's in recovery court. I had one poor little guy call me and say, Ms. Karen, I'm just gonna tell you, I relapsed. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you. I said, well, you gotta <laughs> call your people. He said, I'm on my way down there now, but I had to call you. I'm sorry to let you down. And I said, I, don't let yourself down. You know, take care of you. 
And now that sweetie, he's back and he's got eight months and he just got sick and went in the hospital, bless his heart, and, and he had a, uh, something happened to his gallbladder. And I called him and I said, are you okay? He said, no, Miss Karen, I'm not. I went down there and took him a plant <laughs> and just said hi, you know, because he, some people are really alone. Again, it's the connection. Somebody does care um, because I was almost sitting in prison and we all know, I mean, I don't do prison. I, I didn't even do jail, <laughs> not real well. So what I do with the recovery court participants, because I'm the resource coordinator uh, statewide North Carolina. So what I do with them, once I see they're getting a little stable and she's broken up with the second boyfriend and she's like, Miss Karen, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm like, okay, honey, you know, and she's doing okay. I'll go to her and I'll say, okay, what's your plan for when you finish? She said, well, I got to get a place for me and my kids. And I said, is it that simple? Is that what you're going to do? And she said, I hope so. I said, well, it's really not that simple uh, because I had a son that my mom and dad were taking care of and he was my entire world, y'all. I mean, I left being in recovery, going to meetings every day, helping out in Oxford House so I could be a soccer mom and do long division at 10 o'clock at night at the kitchen table. George, you know what I'm talking about. So it's important that with the recovery court participants that they have a plan for when they leave. See, that, that, I think that's the reason why I feel like Oxford House is so vital for people. It's, it's more than to just stay sober. We have a holistic approach because there's resources out there and there are people that care. So this little girl, even though she's gotten pregnant again, she's got her two kids. She was formerly incarcerated for quite a while. Um, and our um, Recovery Alliance program has opened up housing for people specifically who were formerly incarcerated. And she can bring up to three children. Well, she's got the other two and she could bring her other one. But see, if I wasn't checking with them and checking on them, they wouldn't know that the resources are out there for them. She was in panic mode getting ready to move in with the boyfriend she hates because she's pregnant and she's afraid. And just like when uh, Judge Stoner talked about courage, man, if you forge through some stuff, I mean, what possessed me to go back to college when I had nine months clean? I, I don't know. But I knew I wanted to be at home at night with my son, um, with him, just focusing on him. And, you know, I, I didn't want to be waiting tables and having somebody watch him. And I didn't want that to happen because I could have been incarcerated. I could have not had a life with him. So I needed to make the best life for him that I could. And that meant I needed to be honest in my relationships with myself, my sponsor, my house, um, any type of community partner that I was in line with because in order to do that, I had to work on myself quite a bit because I'm a handful, as y'all can see. Said daddy house on fire. But we had to do um, check-ins with um, our community partners in recovery court because sometimes they would call me and say, <clears throat> I heard so-and-so's boyfriend is staying at the house all the time. And I said, well, that's really none of my business. You know, and, and, and I said that to say, well, of course, we're not going to let him stay there every night. But are we talking about a safety issue? Are we talking about um, something that has happened or transpired, um, violence of any sort? No, we're not talking about that. If a house has gotten uh, COVID or um, one of our houses caught on fire one time, um, those things I will report to recovery court. Other stuff that's personal, um, that's for that person to work on. You don't need a tattletale when you're in recovery court where somebody's always saying something that you did and attacking you personally. But back to my beautiful sequoias. <clears throat> if you all have ever seen the sequoias, and all I've seen is National Geographic, it is so majestic. It is so... Um, it quiets the spirit. And see, that's what we need for our Oxford houses to be. And in order for them to be that, we have to connect with them 
in a non-judgmental way and walk alongside them. You know, I don't care, you know, where you came from, what you did, how many children you've left behind, how many women you've beaten in the past. None of that is relevant here. What is relevant is what can I help you with, with your problem? And the first thing I can do is I can walk the walk. Because if I'm not walking the walk and I'm constantly judging you, um, you're not gonna see anything that's attracting you to an Oxford house. So with people that come in, they already have um, help with mental health and health is mental health. Um, when I see someone that says something is wrong, we try to make sure that they have enough resources to help them because the resources is what will make your life take off. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're gonna get off of probation, you're gonna get off of parole, and it's now what? And the now what is where I come in. But I'm not gonna take up too much more of the time. You guys are awesome, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Karen. Our next panelist is Mr. Stephen Gum. He's an Oxford House resident and outreach worker in Washington State. Get him. Get him. Oh, yeah, this is nerve wracking. <laughs> All right, thank you, George. Good, well, it's not morning anymore. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am an addict. My name is Steve Gum. My clean date is 311 19. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm super nervous. It's the first time I've ever spoke in front of any, a bunch of people besides my chapter and house meetings. Um, a little, I just want to kind of tell a quick story about myself and how I ended up where I'm at. Um, I was fortunate to move into an Oxford house, um, uh, right out of treatment. Um, I lived in that house for four days before I was voluntold um, to become chapter chair. Uh, for the next 11 months, I was Tom Sawyered by my outreach workers, uh, Annie Cleveland and Mick Schroeder. Um, and now I am currently the outreach worker for the Olympic Peninsula. I, I am also one of 15 outreach workers in Washington state. Uh, I have been blessed to have covered multiple counties in Northwest Washington state area. Uh, so here's, a, I wrote a few things down that I thought would be important about drug courts and drug court in my area that I work with pretty closely. Uh, drug courts are evidence-based programs that provide an alternative to, to transitional criminal justice cases for high-risk, high-need individuals struggling with substance use disorder. Um, drug courts improve lives in a variety of ways. They have been shown to increase rates of employment, help people obtain stable living arrangements, improve both mental and physical health, and enhance interpersonal relationships. Drug courts also help reduce levels of criminal behaviors, drug abuse, and are able to keep participants in treatment programs a longer period of time to enhance their recovery program. Uh, here's a little experience that I've had working with the drug court, drug courts in my area uh, in Washington State and Kitsap County. Um, today, I get to be that positive reinforcement between the residents of the houses mm -hmm. um, and the uh, drug court participants that live in our Oxford houses. I get to meet with judges. I get to meet with lawyers. I get to meet with compliance officers. I get to be present for those drug court graduations, which is amazing. Nice. Um, nothing that I like more than seeing people succeed and get their lives back. Um, and when they're, I guess they're dismissed cases um, that brought them into drug court. Uh, I'm very excited to have been a part of the alumni house uh, Grace Harbor County opened their alumni house a few years ago. I was able to be a part of that with my current or previous outreach workers. Um, I am very fortunate to have helped with the first Ox or first alumni drug court alumni house in Kitsap County. 
Um, and basically what that is, is a house designed to help people in their first phase of drug court um, because mistakes happen. Relapses, um, disruptive behavior, non-payment of EES, things like that that will get somebody expelled from an Oxford house. These, house. these houses focus on issues so they can continue building their foundation of recovery to better prepare themselves to enter into an Oxford house. Because um, generally in phase one, you, they cannot have jobs. They can't work. So they are relying on funding from different entities and sources, not just drug court, uh, to pay their EES. Um, and a lot of them, it, just to be honest, they're not ready in phase one. So drug court strongly encourages their participants to live in Oxford House because they know that they stand a better chance of recovery than any place else. Um, and that's pretty much really all I had. I'm just truly blessed and grateful to be an outreach worker and to get to work with drug courts in my area. Uh, and that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and our last panelist, one of my guys, Michael Newcomb. New Jersey. He was one of my roommates, actually, a long time ago. Uh, maybe I've had kids now, so what's my oldest kid? So about 12 years ago or something like that. He said I was his favorite roommate. Well, I added that part, but <laughs> Michael Newcomb. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I am Michael Newcomb. Um, I am a person in long-term recovery. What that means to me is I haven't found an excuse to use any substance, commit any crime, or anything else uh, since July 17th of 2016. Um, I'm just gonna give a, a little bit of my experience with drug court, um, try to save some time for questions. Personally, I, uh, I had a very misconception of what drug court was during my addiction. Uh, I've been to treatment multiple times, and uh, I got my information about what drug court was from uh, us addicts in drug, like, in drug treatment facilities. And from what I heard um, in there, it was just, it's a scam, and, and Bob, like, there's, it's not possible. And... Um, so I went with that for a very long time. Uh, I was in and out of treatment a bunch of times and was given the opportunity to take drug court multiple occasions. And um, I denied those opportunities and continued to use and continued to be in and out of the, in and out of the system, basically. Um, and luckily, with, without the assistance of drug court, I did... Um, at least this time around, uh, I was on probation. Um, so there was experience with POs and all of that stuff. Um, but I got to meet other members in my Oxford house. Um, I've been in and out of Oxford house since my first house was with George here in 2010. Yes. Um, unfortunately, it was not my last one. Um, <laughs> I've been in a, a bunch of others, but um, along the way, I got to meet a bunch of people that actually changed my perception, and this is just my experience as a house member, not as outreach, um, but that drug court actually does work. Um, I've seen it change people's lives, um, and, and for those that actually took advantage of it and weren't trying to get, continue to use on drug court. Um, mm -hmm. My other specialty court was just recent experience as outreach. I recently, about a year ago, opened up a women and children's house in my area. Um, it was our first one. Um, so at that point, I was introduced to the family court system um, and was able to teach the, uh, I'm at a loss for, can't think of the words, just the the people that work in the family court system uh, about what Oxford House is and how it can benefit um, women um, with children that have 
substance use disorder or what alcoholic, what, whatever it may be. And uh, my experience with them is that they've, they've sent a few women to our houses and I've gotten to watch um, what Oxford House has been able to, to get these women, their children back and go from adoption to reunification. And now um, one of the women in my house just recently got back full custody of, of her daughter. Um, and that is due to us and, and what we do. Um, and now I'm drawing a blank. And I want to leave a few minutes for questions. So uh, thank you. Yeah. As Mike said, we're running out of time, some time left for questions. But I, I, I'd be hard pressed as a regional manager if I didn't let you know if there's residents in this room that have lived in Oxford House for a year or more and are willing to relocate and work for Oxford House. I'm going to leave my cards here because I got to solicit new me's and Tara's and Michael's oh, wow. and stuff like that. Um, but if you guys have any questions, we can do by raise a hand or something like that. About a year now, and um, I'm like I was a reentry straight into Oxford House at a prison or whatever, and I want I'm wanting to open up uh, Oxford House in my area that's strictly for reentry individuals. I was wondering if maybe you had any advice about anything with that. Uh, man, first, I want to say thank you uh, for your willingness to want to do that. That's very, very needed. Uh, I don't know what, where, where are you from. Kansas, Kansas City area. Kansas, okay. Yeah, well, thank you for your willingness to do that. Um, you know, reentry, uh, I mean, to me, that is probably one of the areas that we just, we really need. When I say we, mean like um, just our community, our government, you know, you know our, I, I, I tend to think a lot of people that are leaving prison, they intend to do well. Um, but, um, you know, the, as a matter of fact, right now we've been working in Oklahoma trying to figure out, like, how do you hand off someone from prison and put them in an Oxford, put them into safe, stable, sober housing. And um, I was talking to one of our state directors, and, you know, even though in Oklahoma we have, like, hundreds of people that, that, that they try to do that, only about 20% of them actually make it. So, like, out of, out of everybody that applies to get into in the, in Oxford, said, yes, we'll take you, maybe one out of five show up. Uh, they just somehow lose their way, you know, on, on the way there. And um, just kind of being around, uh, you know, addiction, uh, my sense is what happens is that people are leaving, um, leaving prison and uh, they're going, yeah, I'm going to go to Oxford House, but uh, I, need, I need to go see my brother first. I need to go see my mom first, you know. And, of course, you can get there and have a beer. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a beer, right, you know. And so the game's on, so we're going to go have a beer. And next thing you know, the beer makes other things seem more appealing. And next thing you know, they're off the races and they never show up. And so, um, you know, the, the advice, if you could figure out how to do this, which I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's a very... It's figuring out how to have that almost like bed to bed transport. So, which is okay, you're leaving prison and we prison somehow takes you or Oxford picks them up from prison and delivers them there because it's that that connection, uh, man, is just, I think it, uh, I don't have any data on it, but uh, figuring out how to uh, minimize the gap between prison and actually starting that, war that creating that really warm handoff between prison and Oxford. Uh, because 80% uh, of them get lost between prison and Oxford. Um, and so, you, you, you know, you could do a, a, just a, that's a lot of good there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Does anybody else have any other thoughts on, uh, on prison reentry? Talk to your regional manager. Talk to your regional manager. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I thank you so much for, for your willingness to want to tackle that. And that would just be so huge because I think a lot of people leave in prison they want to do well, they intend to do well, and they just really have not had enough structure, they've not had enough education around addiction to understand what their risks are. And so, man, they just, they just get pulled off the rails really quickly, um, and then they're back in the same place they started from, and, and they lost that golden opportunity. So Thank you, Judge. Over. Thank you. Thanks. Can you do it in one? Because we're over time. I'll give you...
And anybody, I'll, I'll stay and answer any questions, even if we're over, if anyone wants to hang around. But. Yeah, I do. We have a veterans receiver court. We have VJOs, yeah. Man, I'm not sure I understand your question. How about this? I'm going to let everybody go, and you can come say your question up here. Thank you guys for attending this session. Any uh, cards up here? Yes.